Death is not easy to talk about. We don't want to think about it, the finality of it. We'd rather distract ourselves from the ending we know we can't escape. But what if we looked at death as more of a beginning than an ending? Right, like a butterfly can't be a butterfly until the caterpillar dies in the cocoon. I mean, death becomes a conversion, a metamorphosis, a necessary action in becoming a glorious butterfly. But could the same be true for us? I mean, that's what Easter's all about. Because of Easter, because of what Jesus has done, death is no longer an ending, no longer a final farewell, a dark and cold conclusion. No, it's a transition, a necessary step into a glorious resurrection. Jesus died so that we could live. This is love. I uh, want to share with you this morning a phrase that some of you might remember, others may not, and, and just kind of go along with us here. The phrase is this, he is risen. Oh, some of y'all know it. Okay, so let's do it again. So the response to that is he is risen indeed. So let me say it again. He is risen. Now y'all learned something today. Look at this, how much further we are, right? Good deal. That is a response. The typical has been around even in the church that I grew up in. We use that. And, and that's a time to remind us here, especially during this time of the awesomeness of God. And so what a joy we have in this moment when we can hear, understand the meaning of Easter, to come together and all the different things that happened. I thought about how something very drastically changed 2,000, just over 2,000 years ago. This morning, as I was driving down the street here to the church, there was nothing else showing life around me. It really caused me to think a little bit, and it wasn't a long drive. It's about a quarter of a mile, as a matter of fact. But there's nothing there. It was everything. There's no other cars. It was just blank. And it took me for a moment there back to that, what it would have been like maybe on that first Easter morning. I thought about how quiet it was and gloom and despair. And in that case, there are a few ladies had woken early and, and headed to the tomb to honor their loved teacher, their rabbi. Someone they believed in, they were blessed by. They saw do miracles and someone innocent of all the charges, yet they saw crucified on a Roman cross of shame. Doing their diligence of working with the body, they set out to do that part. Imagine what it would have been like in the darkness as they came in that grave area and they come up to that tomb and in disbelief and uneasiness, confusion, but a commitment to doing what was right in their heads at the time, what they needed to do. Along the way, they possibly even paused for a moment to ask each other on how they were going to get in. They hadn't thought about that large stone that had been put in front of the grave and it would need to be moved for them to do what they needed to do according to law. He even had a seal on it. How would they break that? How would they get into that? How would they do this? And they ask himself these questions like we ask ourselves these questions. How and how and how and why? And boy, we're good at that, aren't we? <laughs> Yet they moved forward, guided by the glimmer of hope and a deep love for their Savior. Little did they know that while they were sleeping, that night something amazing had happened. When they got to the tomb, really bewildered and confused, not only were the guards gone, but that stone had been moved away. Of course, afraid of what had happened with emotions running crazy, they looked in that grave to find emptiness. Their hearts probably sank for a moment, but it didn't last long. Because God doesn't want us to be in that turmoil in our life. For an angel appeared to them and said, Why do you look for the living among the dead? You talk about confusion, right? We think our world's mixed up now. All of a sudden, everything changed in that moment when they looked. And I thought about the biggest comeback in history playing right out before their eyes. They were allowed to see this really unimaginable up to that point experience They'd only heard of Lazarus and the stories, but now they saw something change, something different in the quietness of that moment. Of course, 
things began to make sense. They remember the conversations Jesus had with them. He talked to them. He guided them. And everything started making those connections. And the light bulb started coming on. And we gather here today to celebrate what happened in that moment. We talk about the things that happened, how it happened, the significances of that moment, the details of why each thing happened the way it did, and we compare versions and accounts and details, a lot of times to satisfy our need for knowledge, or even to try to find the motivation. What? And answer our our human question, why? And looking at all the different aspects, really wanting to know, to prove it, to disprove it, whatever it is, we search for truth. But the reality is this, by all accounts, Jesus died and he came back. He came back from the dead. He paid the price for us so we can have life. And today I want to briefly talk about all that price and the love that was demonstrated for each and every one of us. And so the first thing I want to talk about as we look at this is is this concept of sin. And the scripture uh, comes from Matthew chapter 28. Verse 1 through 10, it says this, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and, then Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white like snow, as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. In this marked moment where we're dealing with everything and their confusion and trying to understand it, we, we know that Jesus, here on the cross and in these moments, as we've described, deals with sin. Now, so often we we've talked about sin, we, we're quick to point out sin in others and others and dealing with these concepts of sin. And I, and I heard a story this week, and I want to share it with you. And it says this. This is a father talking about his kids, and I can relate a little bit. He says this, I woke up when I heard the crash. Not a loud crash, but a crash nonetheless. Before I could peel myself out of bed, I heard the pitter-patter of Little feet running upstairs. Dad, my little five-year-old said in her most innocent, sweet voice, will you make us breakfast? Mmm, sure. Uh, What happened just now? I asked groggingly. Well, we were starving. And so we tried to make ourselves some oatmeal. And I guess the rest. Jane and her older brother Jonas had successfully gotten oatmeal into a bowl, filled it with water, and put it in the microwave. But they had misjudged how hot the bowl would have was when the oatmeal was ready. And dropping a hot bowl is just human reflex. It, I wasn't mad about the bowl. It was old or expensive, or actually both. But I was puzzled. They had tried to clean the mess up of the oatmeal and broken pottery with a mop very unsuccessfully. (laughs) And now a mop was ruined too. I asked the question, why didn't you guys just ask for help? I would have come and helped you clean this up. But before they could respond, the answer became apparent. It's hard enough to ask for help, but it's even harder when you have to ask for help to clean up a mess of your own making. Oh, what we can learn from children, (laughs) the things they teach us. And I I really understood this concept of sin, so it became clear to me even more this week that we do this as adults, don't we? We don't want to ask for God's help, because we can do it by ourselves. We want to try to fix our own problems, and in the reality is we only make things worse. 
So many times we try to think we know what's right and God quickly shows us we don't, right? And things change. Now here's the deal. If we ask for help to resolve a mess, it means that we're admitting fault. Oh, that's hard, right? Ouch, pastor. That kind of hurts. <laughs> and we really don't want to admit guilt. Any of us do. It's an uncomfortable feeling, and sorry is just really an uncomfortable word that so many humans deal with. Of course, we do try to deny it, we ignore it, and even justify our actions all to avoid admission because it's painful. All the time hoping it will just somehow magically go away. But knowing that we have fallen short eats away at us. All of us. Of course, as a community, as a culture, we try to blame everyone else but ourselves for our failures, don't we? We blame our family, the schooling, our job, our community, and of course the list goes on. We pass that blame on, and, and they might carry just a part of who we have become, but it doesn't erase the problem. Sin is still there, and if anything, really, the blame game really just expands it. And that's what the Bible calls as this sin. See, what we fail to maybe realize, or maybe we fail to even grasp, is that sin is a power. We don't think about it that way, but it really is. When it has control in your life, it's hard to deal with. It's such a mess. And sin is the sense of missing the mark or failing to be who God created us to be. It is falling short of the original vocation that God called us to. It's the first calling of God to be God's image bearers to the world around us. We are made in His image. And He wants us to show that love and that example to so many of our family and the world around us. We are to reflect God's wisdom and love and rule in the world. And yet sin prevents us from doing that. Of course, we know sin is a rebellion, a turning away from God, a, a decision to move against Him or be independent of Him. Sin is a transgression, a crossing of lines and boundaries, a violation of another person even. It's sin with a capital S that holds us captive and really paralyzes us with shame. Those that have been around a while, you know I can get interactive here, and so I'm going to invite you to turn to a neighbor and say to them, you're a sinner. All right, now some of you getting that notion. Some of you are like, wait a second, Pastor, that's crazy. No one talks during church. <laughs> well, the truth is, we're all sinners, right? We're there. We've been there. We're a mess. If you look back, you think about it. Anybody over the age of five knows it. We're a sinner. And so today we look at resolving this concept of sin and what it looks like to us. And it talks us and it takes us to this thing that we call the cross. The cross is the way to deal with sin. It was back in the Roman times, and it's the image today that we use, that we look at. It was a place of humiliation, embarrassment to family lines, a public shaming, and a, and a purposeful death as a penalty of a transgression against the law. It was used as a way to keep people in line, reminding them of what the consequences of disobedience would be. Kids, have you always been obedient? No, that would certainly scare me. <laughs> Keeping us in line is what the, the governing authority wanted us to do. But it was here on the cross that Jesus took the ugliness of our sin and the price of our way to make things right with him. He took that. He was the sacrifice. And so I briefly want to look at really the bodily death of Jesus because as it played out, it was so significant and it makes such an impact in this moment. And so we're going to read Mark chapter 15, verse 33 through 37, and it says this, At noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes down or comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. 
In the moment of dealing with sin here, Jesus breathed his last. He was the ultimate sacrifice. He paid the price with his life. The death of Jesus, as it was spoken about here, happened. It's not just a story. It's not a, a movie plot theme. It happened as it was recorded. Multiple people confirmed that. Multiple writings have confirmed that, not just the scriptures as we know them today. And that hurt, that pain, and the finality of that last breath would have been shocking for so many who he had healed, touched, and invested in. He'd been a part of their world. He'd done so much, so many good things. How could it be? But upon that final breath of Christ, the curtain changed. See, there was a curtain in the temple that only the priests could go into, that they could be a part of. They were invited in for their special times of sacrifice. That's where the Holy of Holies was called, and that's where everybody went, and nobody could go in there except for the priest. And so in that special place, that curtain that divided it so that only the priest could go in there, it tore from the top to the bottom. Mark chapter 15 continues on in verse 38 through 41, talks about this significant moment here, and it says this, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the, when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and the younger, uh, and of jo uh, let me start here, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up, from, come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. We think about all of that moment and all the things that happened there and the significance of that moment. It was significant to know that it tore from the top to the bottom because it was God that separated. He, he took that and he tore it. It was only him that could get credit for that. And that curtain separated and allowed us to have access to the kingdom of God. The death of Jesus demonstrated to the people of that day, as well as to us today, that we're all allowed into the presence of God. Sin is the only thing that can separate us from his presence now. So now I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, sin separates us. Good, you guys are getting the hang of this. All right, sin does separate us. And so now I want to take us into a little bit of a part of the story here, and it's the life of Peter because it is significant in helping us some, understand some of this. Of course, Peter was a disciple. He was told that he was the rock and the, the foundation. He was called out from his life as a fisherman, and he was there, and he, and he spent three years with Jesus walking by his side. He carried his badge of joy until he was called out. In that moment, as a part of this crucifixion process, Peter had a big stumbling block, and it was the denial of Jesus. When he was called out from this moment, when he was said that, oh, weren't you with Jesus? He was like, not me. I don't know who that is. And that crazy moment, it didn't happen just once. It happened three times. He denied Jesus. And I had to pause for a moment as I remembered this story and as I looked at this story and, and I remembered back in my own life. And I imagine all of us have these moments where in times where we've denied Jesus to maybe our friends or maybe strangers. Oh, no, I, I, are you a Christian? Oh, uh, well, uh, maybe. Are you going to hurt me? <laughs> What's going to happen? And I thought, man, I sympathize with Peter and that brokenness and that fear and that anger and that anxiety and that not knowing. Luke chapter 22, the verse 54 through 62, 62 talks more about this. And it says this, Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some of them there, when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, they sat down together. Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. Oh, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, uh, you, are all, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. It's like, you are confused, right? <laughs> but an hour later, another asserted, Certainly, 
this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I do not know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Just as Jesus had told them the day before that he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed, things had come to pass. And that guilt that Peter would have carried at that moment would have been almost unbearable. All of those things that happened there. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he whipped, wept bitterly. That's not just a crying. That's not a, a cry of joy. It's a, t- a, a cry of deep, pure just disappointment in myself and my situations. So many things, and he wept bitterly. He was broken. Of course, that brought out in Peter shame and, and really credibility for him because, man, he was the guy. He was supposed to be the guy to take the church and, and move forward, and that was all on him. He was supposed to be that encourager. He was supposed to be that foundation, the strong, solid one. And here, in the midst of that moment of chaos and that moment of tension, we have shame and credibility. I thought more about this uh, issue that came up. You see, this is what shame does to people. It's what it does in our life and our world around us. Shame isolates us. It makes us separate from those around us. It tells us maybe even we're the only ones dealing with this struggle or this challenge. It tries to tell us that our sin is uniquely disqualifying because no one else, I'm sure, has ever done that sin before. When in reality, sin is the same from that time as it was then to today. It makes us an exception in the worst way. We're the one person who we feel like we can't be forgiven. We've done the one thing that cannot be set right. We've gone past that point of no return, and we've fallen too far. How many have ever felt that way? And I even might say this, how many of you are feeling that way today? Man, God, I've done so much, and I don't deserve to be even in this place. I don't even deserve to hear about your good news. I've fallen too far, and I'm a mess, God, and I just... I don't know. Well, that shame, the kind that comes from actual guilt, is not a liar. It just tells us a story as it stands without Jesus. So I want you to turn to somebody now and say, guess what? The story does not end there. Because so often we can be confused that the story is done there, right? The world tells us the story's done. That's it. You're over with. You cannot get back in the good graces of the Father. You're done. But in reality, the story doesn't end there. And Jesus meets Peter where he is at. Well, I tell you, I love this part of the story. I'm going to go to John chapter 21, verse 3 through 7 for this part of the story. And it says this, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, I'm going to pause here for a minute. You talk about feeling, you're already discouraged. You're a fisherman, you've given up everything, and you went out in a boat, and you caught nothing. You couldn't even do what you used to do right. And here we are, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Probably pretty disappointed. He said, "Um, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. I imagine what they would have been like in the boat, like, well, we can't lose anything. (laughs) So they cast the net on the other side. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish, 153 to be exact, when they were counted. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, Hey, I know that guy. It's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say that, in the moment, it is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken off and jumped into the water. He's like, I walked on water once. I'm going. (laughs) 
And he took off going to Jesus. He wanted to get to the guy he betrayed. What a moment of restoration for us that Peter lived out here for us to understand. And I love this moment when Jesus meets Peter where he's at. There in that moment when he tried to go back to what he was used to, and he wasn't even good at that anymore. All of a sudden, Jesus restored him. He tried to get to that point of that comfort zone, and Jesus made it better. Jesus really, in this moment, he reenacted the scene of Peter's first calling. It was like taking Peter back to that start where it all began. He was restoring Peter as he wants to restore us. See, God wants to restore each and every one of us in our sin and our brokenness and our mess. He wants to take us back and say, you know what? All that sin is nonsense. It's brokenness. I died for that. Let's go back to the beginning. And let's start all over. Because I died for those sins. And he wants to get us back to that point. Jesus meets us where we are at in our life. No matter what it is. And we'll talk now about the resurrection. What we came here today to celebrate. See, the resurrection, it changes everything. So I want you to turn to somebody and say, the resurrection changes everything. Now, some of you didn't seem too excited to say that, so I'm going to let you say it again. Turn to somebody else and say, the resurrection changes everything. It does. It makes us all back to that starting point. We have the option of, of starting back over in our life. The power to defeat death only resides in Christ. Peter was changed after feeling defeat and brokenness. He had deserted his Savior, but the empty tomb changed it all. And I was reminded, and I remind you all today, that Jesus comes after us time and time again. He doesn't leave us hanging. He doesn't leave us out there by ourselves. He comes after us time and time again. And for that, I am grateful. I stand here today grateful for what he does for me, what he's done for me. John chapter 20, verse 19 through 23 says this, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He was always saying that. After he said this, he showed them his hand and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I would be too. If we saw a loved one that we were, didn't stick up for, come back as he said he would. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. See, what I realize that all through my life and in all of our lives and every life I encounter is that he has been coming after you. Jesus has been coming after you. Time and time again, provenient grace has been calling you to get closer, to experience the power of Christ, overcoming that grave. And if you're honest with yourself, you can look and see where he has been reaching out to you. It is by divine appointment that you're here. You didn't just stumble in. Well, maybe somebody did. I didn't see it. <laughs> and fall in the doorway. But it's a divine appointment that you're here. You have this moment to come face to face with Christ. Where you are at, he's calling you to a sense of peace, hope, and love. Now I want you to turn to somebody and say, Jesus is calling out to you. Now you guys got the hang of this. This is kind of scary. He is calling out to us. He wants us in such a way. He wants a relationship with us. He wants to provide us with peace. He's always providing us with peace in every situation he encounters. And the reality is you will only have true peace with Christ in your life. The world tries to fill it with all sorts of stuff like success, others, drugs, alcohol, but it will not work to satisfy the longing. I promise you. Those things all give you a sense, a false sense of love that will be fleeting. And you always have to have more to make it right. But with Jesus, he fills that longing. 
the resurrection really changed everything and that they knew it at the time and it changes everything about who we are. We can know that our sins are forgiven. Today, we can stand on that foundation. As I'm standing on this stage, we can know that he loves us and that my sin is forgiven. And for that, I'm grateful. I love the song, The Scars There. It reminds us. I love the song, The Old Rugged Cross. It reminds me, as I sing that, it reminds me how he suffered through the pain and, and suffering that cross, that embarrassment. And how Jesus single-handedly took the sacrifices that were, that were required for us. Our sin on him. We are made new when we profess our faith in Christ. Now I want you to turn to somebody and say, your sins are forgiven. Now see, we started out calling everybody a sinner, and now I can say to you, your sins are forgiven. Look at the change and the transition that takes us. In doing that, when our sins are forgiven, if you've ever forgiven somebody, it's powerful. It's awesome. It's something that I hope we all experience because there's such release in that. And it provides restoration. It provides oneness in a, in, a, in, a, in a relationship. It provides that for your family. It provides in every situation. And Jesus loves us so much that he went to the cross for you and for me. And so now I want you to turn to somebody. This will be the last time, I promise. <laughs> and he says, Jesus went to the cross for you. He did that for all of you. He did that for all of us. And for that, I'm grateful. So grateful of what he did for me. And because of that love, we can be restored. And we are restored to the relationship with God, a personal relationship. Not going through anyone, but you have the ability to say, Jesus, and he'll be right there. All you need to say is, God, I need you in this moment, and he will, like that right there, he hears you. That's the personal relationship that God wants us all to have, to be able to talk to all of us and, and, and think about all the things that happened there and all the things that went on in that moment. He is our Lord and Savior. And in this moment here and in this situation, in this concept, in this idea, we have freedom. Whew. Freedom. We are not bound by the strains of sin anymore, the chains that weigh us down. We have freedom in Christ because of the resurrection. Sin can be forgiven. To be forgiven is to be free, free from guilt, free from shame, free from the power that has enslaved us, and, to be, and free to be fully human. To be what God made us to be, to reflect his image, his wisdom, and his love into the world. That is love. Not the world's view of love, but God's view of love. Of course, a new life in Christ takes us back to where we all began, in a right way with God, a new beginning, a new start, a, a fresh slate, and an experience with love. Nothing is remembered. He washes it white as snow. It's gone. And I praise God for that. And the story of Peter really tells us that Jesus comes to him and speaks to him and allows him to experience that freedom. And so I'm going to read from John chapter 21, verse 15 through 19. And it says this. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Man, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you, were, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. 
Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Follow me. That's love. And it changes everything. See, in this moment, Jesus restored Peter. I'll tell you what, I was praying that God would show me something really new and unique. And and this this Easter season, these last few weeks, God has really shown me the significance of those three restorations. See, Peter betrayed Jesus three times, right? And here, Jesus restored him three times. And God has just taken us on a journey of of how he wants to restore us, make us full, back to a fullness of what he wants for us. And there, Peter's life changed that day. He became the leader of the church, and he was restored in God's love. Well, friends, I want to tell you that your life can change today. The whole trajectory of your life can change in this very moment. Maybe you thought it was game over and you've hit a dead end because of a mistake you've made or a destructive habit you're caught in or a thing that's going on. I don't know. But I've got good news for you. It's not over. Just as it wasn't over when Jesus died on the cross and was buried, it's not over for you. Because Jesus carried our sins upon himself on that cross. Because God raised Jesus from the dead in victory over sin and death. It is not over. Sin is not the end. Today is your day. The phrase that's written in your book and your notes there, and the phrase I want to share with you today is this that this is love and it changes everything. God's dying on the cross was for you and was for me to get us right back where we need to be, take us back to the beginning before all the mess happened to restore us into the oneness. And that's for all of us. So as the band comes to play now, and I'm going to invite you all to stand very briefly here for a moment, just to stretch out. And I'm going to ask you, and I don't know where you're at right now and what situation you're in right now and what's going on in your world right now, A lot of us and a lot of people have secret stuff going on that they don't want anybody to know about, but Jesus knows about it. And guess what? Jesus wants to restore you today. We've all made mistakes. We're all sinners. We're all broken. We're all a mess. But God brings us this time of decision. A reminder that we can start over with Him. So right now, I'm going to invite you all to close your eyes and bow your heads. There might need to be somebody today who says, Pastor, I'm a mess right now, and I just need to start over with God. I need God to change me right now in this moment, and I want to start over with Him. He's been talking to me, and I've been running, and I'm tired of running. that's you, I want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. See those hands. You can put your hands down. Father God, right now, go and be with those right now who raise their hands, Father. That profession that said they need you right now in this moment, Father. Go and be with them, Father, in in their situation, whatever it is. Help them to recognize you're starting over with them, Father. You're ready to do something new in their life. Your love changed everything for all of us. And we have a privilege today to stand here and confess our sins to you and to start over. It's what you desire for our life, Lord. Father God, I move in those lives and others that maybe did not raise their hand. Be in their situations. Be in all of our lives, Lord. Help us to be who you've called us to be to fulfill the plan that you have for us. This is truly love. 
and he's called you out of your mess today into restoration with him. Father God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for restoration. I thank you for making things right. Father, I thank you for our family, for bringing us to this point in our day, in our time, in our history, to come and to celebrate and to remember the awesomeness of your love. Move on our lives today, Lord. Be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. At this time, we, we want to celebrate not only new life and new restoration, we celebrate for what Jesus did for us there on that cross as we celebrate a time of communion. Now, I was thinking about uh, how we do communion here. Well, we've done it a little bit differently than we've done before. And we have these wooden trays up here that in a moment I'm going to ask the head of the household to come and pick up a tray and take it back and serve your family. And if you have extras on your, on your tray to serve others around you, other single folks around you. And I thought about these trays and I remember when we were making these, these last, this last fall. And I thought about how some of them were scarred and scratched up and, and praise God, I got some great carpenters and they worked on them and they, they buffed them out and they tried to make them all smooth and they put wood filler in to make them look nice and pretty. And I thought, but you know, the cross wasn't that way. The cross was broken. It was a shame. It was all of that. And Jesus made something great out of that. And I thought what a privilege it is to have these here today. And so at this moment right now, I'm going to invite you up. In the Church of the Nazarene, we have open communion. It doesn't matter what background you are. If you profess a faith in Christ, you are invited to partake of the communion table. And so at this point, I'll invite out the heads of the household to come, pick up a tray from the altar here, and take it back and serve your family, and wait till everyone is served, and we'll take you through this time of communion.
Supper, instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is a sacrament which proclaims his life. His sufferings, his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again, it shows forth the Lord's death until his return. The Supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. It is, also, it is to be received in reverent appreciation for the gratefulness for the work of Christ. All those who are truly repentant, forsaking their sins, and believing in Christ for salvation are invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. We come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and be made one by the Spirit. And in unity with the church, we confess our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this table that we are here to partake in what you've done and what you're going to do. Father, you've allowed us to, to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim the release of the captives and set at liberty those who are oppressed. Father, we thank you for Christ and that he healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners and established the new covenant and forgiveness of sins. We live in this hope of his coming again. In your name we pray, amen. As we take the bread, it's not to be taken lightly. We look at it on the night in which he was betrayed. He took the bread, he gave thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take the bread. Likewise, when supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take the cup. Remember what he did for you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the bread and the cup. We thank you for what you've done on the cross. We thank you in these times we can remember all that you've done for us and how you preserve us blameless into everlasting life. We're thankful for everything and where you're taking us, Lord. We give this time to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now we're getting ready to do the last thing of the service today, it's a time of baptism, a time of joy. Now this is going to be, I'm going to do something, guys, that I've never really done before much. I've done it one other time. And there may be someone here today, I feel like God prompted me to do this. It was from yesterday. And there may be someone here today who's started on a new journey with God. And you want to say, you know what, Pastor, I want to be baptized today too. I want you to know it's okay. And so we invite you, if you would like, to step out. And if you want to be baptized this morning along with the one that we have, I invite you to come back around the side of the, the doorway here and let this be a day of beginning new again. And so we invite you, if you want, just to step up and say, you know what, I'm going to be baptized today. I want to start my life fresh and anew with you. And so if that's you, as I go and prepare, the, the band's going to sing a song quick. I invite you to come up here and join us back here behind the stage for this baptism. We're going to sing of His amazing grace.
participation by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in incorporation into his body, the church. It is a means of grace proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Apostle Paul declares that all who are baptized into Jesus Christ be baptized into his death. We are buried with him through baptism so that uh, just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too are raised to walk in newness of life. We have been united with him in his death. We will also be united with him in his resurrection. The Christian faith in which you now come to be baptized uh, is affirmed in the Apostles' Creed, which we confess. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Will you be baptized into this, Kendra? I will. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do you believe that he saves you now? I do. As a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, will you follow him all the days of your life, growing in grace and the means and the love of God and, and neighbor? I will. All right. What a joy it is to come before you today. Pastor John is here. I'm going to grab this here, put this here, and uh, <laughs> we'll baptize you. Okay. Kendra Allen, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, in a really cool thing, yes. <laughs> we have one more that we're going to baptize today. What a joy it is to um, have... Katrina, that's right. <laughs> I was trying to remember. I knew Katrina. Well, there's so much to Katrina's story, how she started out, and um, one of the first ones I remember at the altar, right over there, where you started your life new again. And it's been a journey I know you've been on. And, and we've been talking about this for a while, but what a joy it is to be able to come and do this today. And so I'm going to put this on your nose, um, and then we'll just dip you back, okay? Why don't you grab one of my arm there? Okay. Katrina, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me pray for us. Father God, what a day of celebration, what a day of joy, what, a, what an opportunity for public profession of you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing and all that you've done and all you continue to do for us. Lord, we just ask, Father, you continue to work in us fresh and anew each and every day. Lord, we love you and we celebrate you today on this Resurrection Sunday. We, Father, we put our hope and our faith and our trust in you. We just honor you, Lord. Help us as we leave this place with every breath to glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed week.